Okay, so we're one, two, three. Yeah. So we're going to get started here. My name is David Germano. I'm from the Department of Religious Studies and Contemplative Science Center, and I'm here to introduce today's speaker, Professor George Dreyfus, who will be talking on what is meditation good for? Reflections on the use of meditation in the study of consciousness. And the talk today is co-sponsored by the Department of Religious Studies, the Contemplative Science Center, and the Tibet Center. So um, I've known George for a long, long time, like I think 25 years or 26 years, something like that. And uh, George is really an amazing figure. Um, he wrote two books that really were like watershed moments in the field of Buddhist studies and Tibetan studies. And that by itself is kind of an amazing thing. Most people don't write two amazing books, but the other amazing thing about it is that these two books are in completely different areas. And so the, the first book was called Recognizing Reality, which is about Buddhist epistemology and logic, this kind of hardcore tradition of Indian and Tibetan philosophical inquiry in a, a Buddhist medium. It's famed to be one of the most difficult subjects of traditional Asian thought. And what was remarkable about the book was not only did it have, you know, cover in a very expansive fashion the, the major topics in the field, but it did so in an actual readable fashion because the other thing about this tradition is it's really mostly unintelligible to the vast majority of people on the planet Earth. And so the fact that George could write something that was actually intelligible, eloquent, articulate, and a number of people could read and actually appreciate what the conversation was, and then to furthermore put that into connection to related issues in Western philosophical discourse was really just a remarkable achievement. And the second book that he wrote was called The Sound of Two Hands Clapping, which is a kind of ethnographic uh, reflection on the nature of Tibetan Buddhist monasticism. And for this, he drew upon his own experience because as a young Swiss man, which if you don't recognize was many years ago for George, he found his way to India and joined a Tibetan Buddhist monastery and became the first a Western person to actually receive the highest monastic degree in the Tibetan Buddhist monastic tradition. So he was a monk back then for 15 years in India. And after he finished his what's called a Geshe degree, which is the equivalent of a doctor of divinity in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, he found his way to the University of Virginia. And I don't know when that was, like 1985, I know, because I just asked him recently. And so in 1985, he left India, and he... It was yesterday. <laughs> so in 1985, he found his way to the University of Virginia, and he was still a monk then, um, and a Swiss monk with a lot of Tibetan ideas in his head. And he was actually a monk here at the Charlottesville, Virginia, for two years. And he was part of our doctoral program in Department of Religious Studies. And just to be clear, that was before my time. He's older than I am. Um, so, and he was here at the University of Virginia and really like an unprecedented student because you usually don't have like doctoral students that have Doctor of Divinity degrees from Tibetan Buddhist monastic traditions. So it wasn't like he learned how to speak Tibetan or read Tibetan or think about Buddhist systems and so forth here. But what he did was he soaked in a broad variety of different types of academic knowledge, including Western philosophy. And so that's his kind of unusual background. There are, since then, other people that have gone through the Tibetan monastic tradition and, and done that training. But to have someone go through that and have that deep traditional knowledge, and then also go through a kind of Western academic training and come out of it as really one of the most brilliant, learned people you're going to meet, that's really quite extraordinary. And so that was the background for which these two books came out of. And the second book, The Sound of Two Hands Clapping, drew upon that experience in India to think about what is the nature of Tibetan Buddhist learning? What is learning like in a Tibetan Buddhist monastery? What is the community like? And so it's really a kind of ethnographic, it's not really a historical study, but it's an ethnographic set of reflections on the nature of Tibetan Buddhist monasticism that ranges very broadly. And so the other thing that George over the years has been is one of the few people in humanities that has been involved in these kind of broader conversations about the nature of contemplation, meditation, mindfulness. And over a number of years now, he's played a central role in offering an articulate philosophical voice for thinking about some of these issues that's both rooted in the traditional Buddhist 
um, thought and practice, but also is informed by Western traditions of phenomenology and related philosophical discourses, and has been a central figure in creating this kind of dialogical space between the humanities and the sciences in thinking about the nature of contemplation, traditional and applied and so forth. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome him back here to the University of Virginia to share his most recent thoughts about meditation um, and its use in the study of consciousness. So please join me in welcoming George Dreyfus. Thank you, David. After such an introduction, I can only disappoint you, but uh, here we go, right? OK, what I want to, uh, so David has told my title. Uh, first, thanks for inviting me. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here uh, and to come back to UVA, which has changed quite a lot, probably mostly for the better. And uh, so what I t want to talk about is a class I have been holding at Williams for several years and what I make of it. Now, there are many things in life that are surprising, sometimes really good, sometimes really bad. And the rise in the fame of meditation is certainly one of the most surprising things for me. Uh, when I was a graduate student here, we were barely, uh, I mean, we could say we were Buddhist, but that was seen by, with a considerable suspicion by other people, and it was just unthinkable to use meditation or talk or, 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 or yeah, practice or use meditation in an academic context. You were allowed to obviously study uh, text and so on, but to really practice and uh, think about meditation as a practice, that was totally unthinkable. And so it's only gradually that uh, 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 my interest has been aroused by looking at how uh, a lot of people are doing meditation, and right now probably everybody and your sister is doing meditation, right? I was the airplane with a med student from here. It's like, oh yeah, this is real. Mindfulness is really helpful for stress and so on. So yeah, this is a really new period. And so I thought, why not try to do a class thinking about that? And, uh, or trying not just think about that, but try to do about it. Now, there are many ways I could have approached uh, uh, the topic. Uh, obviously, what is most popular these days is uh, the approach of meditation through natural sciences. And this is what Mind and Life has done. And uh, I find that interesting, but I live in a little college, so I don't have a lab. And so what I did is I designed a course to try to uh, use meditation to uh, observe consciousness and see what can be done and what cannot be done. And I, so I designed the course with my colleague, Joe Cruz, who is uh, both a philosopher and a cognitive science person. So he's the one who, know, who knows something. I was just kind of trying to find my way. And so... This, paper, this uh, uh, talk is really a reflection of what I've done now for a number of years in trying to think about wh what's your use of meditation in the observation of consciousness. So it's a very peculiar topic. Uh, obviously, like you said, the title is kind of switch and pull. What is meditation for? Well, meditation is not meant to be a way to observe consciousness for the most part, right? It's meant to transform and so on, uh, the person, but uh, I've used it in a very, very peculiar way as a way to see what can be done with meditation with undergraduate, uh, as you know, most so-called scientific experiments in psychology are done with undergraduate, so it's not so different, but this is uh, the, the students, and so this is my reflection about uh, uh, this. Obviously, let me repeat, lest I be misunderstood, meditation is not mostly meant for the observation of consciousness, but this is how I have used it 
and I want to uh, give you a few, uh, make a few remarks about what I think can be done, what I think cannot be done. So now an obvious answer, what is meditation good for in this particular context, would be, would be to introduce students to introspection. And that's true because uh, most people are not very familiar with introspection. And in fact, most, I would think most undergraduate, or most people are probably pretty confused uh, when they're told to introspect because what is it that you're supposed to observe, right? So this is useful, but this is limited, I would say, propedeutical. So I want to make a more solid case of what can be done. Uh, and the case I want to make is to say that meditation or certain types of meditation, uh, and I'm going to tell you the types of meditation I use, work really well with phenomenology. And so this is the case I want to make. So. It's going to be a slightly stronger case, so it will, though it will have a number uh, uh, of limitations. <coughs> so the course is designed as uh, a way to understand consciousness by confronting the first-person perspective with the third-person perspective. The first-person perspective is how I see the world from my own perspective, right? I see the world like, you know, there is a room displayed, I see it from a certain angle, I have a certain uh, uh, visual perception, right? That's all first-person perspective. The first mistake that students make is to confuse first-person perspective to what's going inside, and then think that third-person perspective is what's going outside. That's a total misunderstanding of phenomenology and what first-person perspective. My vision of uh, you sitting there is a first-person perspective because that's how uh, the room is given to me in my field of experience. Third-person perspective would be uh, trying to think about what's the real shape of the room and that would involve uh, a much more objective perspective or the combination of different first-person perspectives giving rise to intersubjectivity, and then through science, you go from intersubjectivity to objectivity, and that's a third-person perspective. So please do not make the mistake of thinking that first-person perspective is what's inside me, and third-person perspective is what's outside me. That's not what it's about. It's a different in perspective. It's a difference between, if you want to say, the subjective perspective and the objective perspective, which phenomenologists would argue is constructed uh, from the first-person perspective, but uh, go way beyond because it uh, uh, aspires in large part to be an objective perspective. So a no third-person perspective would be how big is this hall, how many uh, uh, see it, it has all this is third person perspective versus my own experience uh, uh, which is subjective right so the course is uh, this uh, this kind of confrontation between this first perspective person perspective as far as consciousness is concerned and the pronouncements of cognitive science on various topics such as consciousness, attention, emotions, and so on, and trying to find what happens when we confront the two. Now, you may think, well, yeah, uh, this, is, this is kind of strange, because obviously between the third-person perspective and the first-person perspective, maybe you think brain science is going to resolve the question, but actually, for the most part, it does not as of now, right? So it's really, there is an enormous gap, and this is what we are trying to look at, what happens when these two perspectives are confronted. So to develop the first-person perspective, I ask my student to meditate. We meditate in class for about 
10, 15 minutes. This is my only experience as a meditation teacher. But I have some practice myself, so I think I'm not totally responsible. Uh, I also tell them that if they practice meditation intensively, they should uh, have the, be in contact with people who are really qualified to help them because weird things can happen. But uh, that's what I do. And I ask them to meditate every day, 10, 15 minutes. And I ask them to hold a journal, a meditation journal. And it's really interesting because when I read the journal, I put like two, three sentences. I know immediately whether they really done it seriously or not. You can tell immediately. It's not, it's not even close. But, you know, that's okay. It's education and I'm not, uh, uh, this is not meditation labor camp, right? Okay, so this is what I do. And <coughs> so what, my, what I have noticed in the, at first I was just shooting, I mean, in the dark, I had, we were, had really no idea. It looked like an interesting uh, program, but we had no idea really what to do until I discovered that really meditation and phenomenology really work well together. Okay, so what is phenomenology? Well, that could, we could do a whole year of seminar on that. So uh, I'm going to give you a, a couple of sentences to kind of put you on the same page. But basically, uh, phenomenology is guided by uh, Husserl, who said, back to the thing themselves. Now, it's a very unfortunate statement, because by the thing, he didn't really mean the thing, but he meant back to a, uh, experience or the appearance. So phenomenology is a discipline which seeks to provide a description of uh, our experience from the first-person perspective. Okay? And I'm going to say a bit more how it does that. But that's what phenomenology, at least at some level, does. Now, if you read phenomenologists like Husserl, Heidegger, Meloponte, they each have, in different ways, very ambitious program, particularly for Husserl. And obviously, I'm doing phenomenology in a very, very limited and almost vulgar way. But I think, actually, uh, I, I think it may be not so vulgar because I think phenomenology is good for providing description of the first-person perspective. And that's why, how I use it, and I use it in combination with certain types of meditation, and I think it works really well. Uh, okay, so now you may see, well, what's the point of describing experience, right? Why describe experience? And you could say, well, this is trivial. I, and actually, I would say it's not. Because try to describe your experience now, outside of being bored. Uh, try to describe your vision. What is your experience? Well, you know, most people will say, I see chairs, I see table, and so on. But that's not a description of experience. That's a description of the object of your experience. That's not a description of your experience. So describing experience is actually quite difficult. So what we, uh, uh, in this course, we're aiming is to find a, a, a deeper and systematic description of uh, subjective experience. Now, obviously, even if you were, even if you were better than just talking about chairs and tables, uh, you might get into such a detailed description of your experience, like Proust, right? If you want to read about a detailed observation of experience, you read Proust, right? And there it's so many details that you kind of get lost. And that's not very useful to do 
to talk about the nature of consciousness. So what we're really trying to do is to find what I call putative candidates for invariance of mental states. That is, features of mental states that are going to be present in almost any mental state from the point of view, from the first person perspective, right? Now, what are they going to look like? Well, things like intentionality, having an object, holism, foreground background structure, ownership. These are all features uh, which I think are a good possible candidate for being invariant features of uh, mental states of consciousness, right? Why we want to do that? Because we want to have an, a description of consciousness which is broad enough to be generalized, right? And then which could be uh, used by uh, people doing third-person perspective as a target of explanation. Because obviously, what are you explaining when you do third-person perspective? Well, you're trying to explain something, but the explainenda or explainendum is actually quite important to think about what it is, right? So I think phenomenology is really good as providing this kind of putative candidates for uh, invariance. Now, uh, Husserl would talk about transcendental method, but uh, uh, I don't have such high ambition. But it's important to not to uh, stop at kind of trivial features, but to try to find what are the uh, really deeper articulation of mental state, at least from the point of view of the first person perspective, because obviously the third person perspective might discover that actually these are not necessarily that important, but that in itself would be an important finding, right? So this is what uh, the class is after. And for that, we use a little bit of meditation. Now, the first challenge to that was what the point of providing a description of, conscious, of uh, consciousness from the first person perspective. I hope I have answered that challenge and you all understand what it is that we are trying to look for through observation of consciousness combined with meditation. Now, there is a deeper challenge by many contemporary thinkers. Uh, the most well-known and son to read is Dennett, uh, who has a view of mind quite different and who challenged uh, this phenomenological project of finding uh, putative candidates for invariant features of consciousness, right? So, what's the challenge? The challenge is the following, and it's actually a deep one. For Dennett, there is no way to make a principal distinction between first and third person perspective. We cannot distinguish the qualitative aspect of experience from the retrospective judgments that we make about them. So, the challenge is, so far I have suggested that through observation and meditation, we can observe directly consciousness. But that's not true. We can't. All what we can is have a retrospective recollection that might happen very shortly after the mental state, but we can't observe the mental state directly. And so the challenge of Dennis is like, how are you, how sure can you be that your recollection of your mental state is accurate? Is there even a way to make sense of how to distinguish uh, accurate recollection from inaccurate recollection? Because it's all 
retrospective anyway, right? Because when you do the recollection, even if it's time t2, the mental states that you were observing at time t1 uh, is already gone, right? And so there is a gap, and then it argues that that gap renders the, pro the project of uh, observing consciousness from a subjective perspective uh, impossible. And he gives a number of uh, funny little cases, which he called intuition pumps. And uh, one of his cases involved uh, two people, Chase and Sanborn, and uh, they are uh, tasting uh, the Maxwell House coffee. I have no idea why they chose this example. I would never even dream of bringing a coffee like that, but anyway. Chase says, the experience of tasting has changed. Sanborn says, no, the experience has not changed. It's the appraisal of the experience which has changed. And uh, then the question is, how are you going to distinguish one from the other, right? Which goes to the challenge of how you're going to distinguish accurate from inaccurate uh, recollection of your mental state because any recollection from your mental of your mental state is retrospective and therefore open to reconfiguration as it's well known in social psychology right so this is a deeper challenge this is more interesting and uh, uh, this is, in a way, uh, where phenomenology comes in and says, yes, we can provide description. So, uh, to that purpose, how long am I supposed to talk for? Okay, okay. So, to that purpose, Husserl designed a... Uh, 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 phenomenological method. The first uh, stage is called epoche, which means suspension. And <laughs> it is the idea that to describe mental states, you should suspend all ordinary assumptions that you have about the objects of your experience. So if I ask you, describe me your visual experience, the first thing you should do is bracket away any idea that you are in an auditorium with chairs and so on, and that there are other people. That's the first thing to do away with, because if you do that, it takes you, it gives you an image, uh, uh, a description of consciousness as being an encounter between an external object and an internal mental state. And that's not what is actually going on from the first-person perspective. It's a confusion of the first and the third-person perspective. In the third-person perspective, that's indeed what's going on. In the first-person perspective, that's not what is going on. What is going on is a whole field of uh, visual experience which is given to me. And so to try to provide a description of that visual field, I first need to suspend uh, all ordinary assumptions, uh, the uh, ordinary attitude that I have towards uh, this uh, object. And that's a really useful move to make. And at first, when I study phenomenology, uh, whether the method is really important or not is actually a debate among phenomenologists. But I could never understand what it meant to wipe to do this, but then I started to teach my students how to try to describe features of the, of the experience, suddenly it started to make sense that indeed you need to suspend all the ordinary assumptions about what it is that you're doing in order to try to get as close as possible to what is given in the visual experience. And that's actually quite hard to do, but at least it makes sense. The second step 
is derived from the first, and it's called phenomenological reduction, which just is the realization that actually it's consciousness from a subjective perspective is not an encounter between an internal subject and an out external object, <coughs> but is uh, a, a kind of single field of experience with a subjective and an objective pole, right? So rather than see the subject and the object as separated, in the first person perspective, what you have to do is see them as being correlated, right? Which is actually what they are in the first person perspective. And then the method goes on to eddytic variation and so on. Uh, and I'm not going to go there. <coughs> so, but uh, this is some of the method I use to try to uh, uh, push students, and actually it works relatively well, to understand what it is that we are trying to do. And then, and then uh, we do meditation. Okay, maybe I should say, uh, before I describe what kind of meditation, uh, so phenomenological method claims that if we follow it, we can provide description of uh, mental states from a first-person perspective. That's a claim. That claim is debated by Dennett, and so that's an interesting debate. What has to be understood, however, is what the claim exactly is. The claim is not that experience can be observed immediately or directly. Immediately means what? Independent of any conceptualization. The reason this is not possible is that our experiences come loaded with concepts. These concepts are not something we think about, but for example, right in my uh, right in my visual field, there is already a lot of categorization which is going on. In fact, I see chairs, people, and so on. And that's already given in my visual experience. So the claim is not, first, that we observe consciousness immediately. Okay. Second claim, which is also not the case, that we observe consciousness directly, right? Because then it has pointed out that there is this gap which needs to be, uh, which is there, right? I say that because some proponents of what people call contemplative science, which I have no real idea what it is about because there are so many different versions of that. Some people think, oh yeah, we should just use meditation as a kind of direct observation, like a telescope, uh, observing mental states. No, that's not possible. All what we can do is try to provide uh, recollection, and the idea is hopefully that uh, doing phenomenology, and in my case doing meditation, certain types of meditation can help. So the idea is not that this kind of observation is going to lead to some kind of definitive answer about the nature of consciousness. It's just that uh, this kind of uh, observation can provide uh, interesting description and hopefully more accurate description of what's happening in the uh, 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 in consciousness. So, uh, <laughs> and the reason is that there is no certainty is that because observation is done through recollection, 
uh, it's also being, it's also, uh, it's always going to contain a number of interpretation and assumption, and you can never get around to that. And so, rather than claim that you can observe like consciousness, like uh, Galileo observed uh, the, what was that, the moons of Jupiter, right? Uh, through telescope? No, that's not how you do, uh, how you can observe consciousness, because consciousness change moment by moment, and so you always, there is always a gap, and it's always, the, the best you can do is try to be, provide best, more and more accurate recollection, right? Okay, what kind of meditation we do? David is going to hate that because he wants kind of a really strange meditation with uh, uh, mantras and people flying around, and this is not what we're doing. We're doing the really boring stuff, like mindfulness and some kind of simplified open presence, right? That's what we're doing. Why are we doing that? Because that's the kind of meditation which pro pro uh, produce non-discursive, non-ideational mental states, and these are the ones which are, uh, I think, most interesting to observe. And that's why we choose. Uh, this is why you should choose your speakers more carefully. <laughs> Sorry for that. Okay, so wh what I found uh, really uh, helpful in meditation uh, is that it suspends identification in this kind of meditation. Okay, well, I'm going to say meditation, but you please understand this kind of meditation, which is a very limited segment of Buddhist meditation. There are plenty of meditation with uh, much more uh, very different uh, type of meditation, uh, concentration, use of mantra, visualization, uh, ritual, all kind of different type of meditation. So uh, I, when I teach Buddhism, this is actually what I teach, what, what David thinks is the fun stuff, right? But this is for the sake of observing consciousness. And so mindfulness and open, kind of very simplified open presence is really a very good uh, meditation because it helps to suspend the identification that we have with mental state. And so when the identification that we have with mental state is suspended, I think it opens the door to uh, a more accurate form of recollection. Remember, that's all what we have. But I think that's at least my uh, hypothesis. So I found this step of disidentification really useful. It's also really useful to do phenomenology because once you have disidentified with the mental state, it's much easier to think about what is the experience in itself. Whereas if you're caught in the experience, you know, it's just like, yeah, there is, I am here, there are chairs there, and that's what my experience is. Once you can, if you can disidentify it with the mental state, you still cannot observe it like directly, but it gives you a better chance to provide a more uh, accurate description of what is going on, particularly in terms of the interesting invariant features that might be uh, there. So I, I found that this identification is an extremely powerful tool to observe mental states from a first-person perspective. And uh, combined with phenomenology, I think it's actually an interesting way to try to go about providing descriptions uh, of interesting descriptions of mental states. The most memorable teaching moment is when I ask my students, what happens when you lose the object of meditation? Okay? People have meditated in this room? Okay? So you're familiar with this experience, right? So that's a really interesting moment because 
Uh, I asked him, when you lose the, uh, the object, what is in your mind? And it's very ex interesting because most of the time it's kind of diffuse experience. The mind is not completely empty, but it has no clear focus very often, right? So this experience suggests that when observed from the first person perspective, consciousness seems to contain the kind of self-presence and immediate attunement that differs from introspective knowledge that we can have regarding our mental state. So some people talk about difference between access consciousness and phenomenal consciousness. I think in a way when your mind kind of wanders kind of in kind of neither is kind of in a vague state and is not clearly on an object. Uh, it's a very interesting experience because it's not the case that your mind is completely empty. There is a way in which you're keeping track of you can most of the time remember some elements of what you were kind of confusing daydreaming. And obviously, you can never observe it directly. But that's interesting, because that's a state of the mind which has no focus. And so it introduces the student to this idea that actually there is a lot more in consciousness than the immediate object that we are aware of. That there is behind this kind of access to what we're paying attention in uh, normal consciousness, there is a whole background which is uh, part of the conscious experience, but which is usually not uh, thematized, right? And it's not that when you're losing your object, you're able to thematize it, but when you come back to the object, you're able to think, oh yeah, I was lost, I was kind of in, in La La Land, and it's not the case that I was, my mind was totally empty, but it's also not the case that I was fully conscious either, right? And that's a really one of the interesting moments that I can point to students to try to introduce them to this idea that consciousness is this complicated foreground, background structure, and that consciousness is not just an encounter between a subject and an object, but is an experience which takes place in a complex field uh, in which there is there are other things besides what they are directly aware of. So this is just one example of what I do uh, to try to introduce them to an idea that uh, consciousness might not be just uh, this kind of information processing device, right? In which, like, there is one mental state, one object kind of idea, which you find in the early Abhidharma, but might be actually that there is another kind of uh, uh, consciousness, a kind of background consciousness, a kind of global receptivity that is impossible to observe directly, which is uh, cannot be seen because it's not an object, but through meditation, because you completely suspend the uh, identification with the object, or at least you try to do so, I think that kind of uh, uh, idea of, about consciousness as this kind of global receptivity becomes uh, a little bit more comprehensible. Okay, so uh, how are we doing? Good, we have still what, five minutes? Yeah, okay. So, uh, so what meditation does is provide a discipline to uh, help people to describe mental states. Uh, it provides also some interesting experiences. Uh, in a way, this is the rival of Bennett's intuition pump, right? This is a anti-reductionist 
co-phenomenology intuition pump that this experience is ah because they suggest to 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 the people who does undergo them that yes indeed maybe there is another way to think about consciousness rather than thinking about consciousness as the encounter with a single object but obviously uh these are just suggestion uh they are also interesting attempt to provide uh, recollection. But we should always remember that none of these recollection are direct observation. And therefore, we, that makes us aware of some of the limits of the use of meditation in the search for more accurate description of experience. The data obtained from meditation are not the reflection of pure experience, for they're not obtained directly through their observation, but as a result of a process of interpretation based on experience. Hence, there is no certainty about data, but this is not specific to this case, meaning to the case of subjectivity, for it is true of scientific endeavor in general. Data accepted as valid, not because they correspond to the observations of some bare intrinsic reality, but through a process of stabilization based on the complex interaction of experience and interpretation. In this respect, the subjective data obtained from meditation is no different. It is elaborated through a process of interpretation as in need of further validation. This is where another step of the phenomenological method may be relevant, the intersubjective corroboration, which is actually the fourth step that is, when you provide description of mental states, if your description are completely idiosyncratic, then there is a problem. And so they have to be verified by the description of other people, right? Which is that is this intersubjective corroboration. The relevant question then becomes, can we develop a systematic phenomenology of meditative state that provides something close to a set of coherent description of comparable meditative states? That's my question. That's also what I would like more to see, which is phenomenological description of the mental states that take place in meditation, because that would be hopefully helpful that would also uh, hopefully cohere into a set of coherent descriptions, or maybe not, but that would be in itself quite interesting and important. And so I think uh, uh, on the side of people interested in the study of meditation from the first person perspective, I think it would be good if there were more uh, systematic uh, phenomenology of meditative states uh, that would be really helpful material. And maybe we could then find uh, what are maybe some features that are more intrinsic to conscious experience and what are, what are not, and we might have surprises. But that, I think, would be uh, uh, a, a val uh, an interesting uh, project which would provide with intersubjective validation, right? Okay. So, uh, I think I've made most of my point uh, uh, clear, hopefully. Uh, I think when students are meditatively trained, they become better observers of mental states. Obviously, that has to be verified, and I know that there are some experiments that try to verify to which degree meditators would be better observers of mental state. There is a very famous set of experiences, and I wish it were done with, medita with advanced meditators, uh, because I wonder if the result would be the same. Lebet is a famous cognitive scientist who uh, did experiment in which he would ask people to, uh, to uh, press a button and there would be a watch going on very fast around in front of them and try to uh, 
uh, decide to try to notice when is it that they decided to press the button. That's a very famous uh, set of experiments did, done by Lebev Wengner is a person who has uh, done, gotten a lot of mileage out of it. I think he goes way too far in his conclusion. But that's a very imper uh, interesting experience. Why? Because it shows, because you obviously do an, answer, uh, uh, an EG at the same time, and then you notice that the impulsion to, uh, to do something happens way before the subject notice that he's decided to, to do something. Okay? So now, don't make too many, uh, conclusions because that's, uh, we, we, one of my friends, Evan Thompson, has a whole class, a whole course about that. I have only one class about that. So there is a lot more to say. And there are many interpretations, and I think most interpretations go too far. But it would be interesting to have uh, meditatively trained, uh, well-trained, not undergraduate, uh, who, does, uh, who do a few hours of meditation, but really good meditators and train whether we get the same uh, result or whether they're able to be much better observer of their own intentions. I have no idea about that, but this is one kind of uh, 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 contribution that uh, the practice of meditation could make to the uh, study of consciousness. Another one, obviously, is the one I have mentioned, which is it provides interesting intuition pumps, right? And I think that's an important uh, contribution because uh, it's it's cognitive science is in its infancy, and uh, at that point, we need to think in different ways about consciousness, not just all the same ways. And uh, so intuition pumps can be really helpful. Obviously, this is all uh, very uh, tentative because uh, there is no certainty uh, in that endeavor, but uh, I think we can go be beyond the contemporary hype and try to find some interested uses for the practice of meditation in describing uh, consciousness. And this is what I have tried to do today. Okay, thank you. <laughs>